Hey friends, welcome back to the journal feed. My name is Nick Zelt and this is the only place to get spoon fed the latest and greatest of emergency medicine. So let's get right into it. Let's see what we're going to be covering from this past week. It's fluids, fluids, fluids this week, everybody. Aren't you excited? Yes, first off, we have the age old battle of normal saline against balanced fluids. And this rages on in children as well as in adults. It's about as uneventful as it usually is, though. Second, don't drown the brain. There's a careful balance of fluids that you should be giving to TBI patients. After that, DKA patients get lots and lots of fluids. How's their sodium feel about that? And does it even matter? And then the last two articles are actually studies from the basics trial. First off, how fast to give fluids, quite fast or really fast. And then another strike in the battle between normal saline and balanced crystalloids. This, of course, is the audio version of the past week's summaries, which this week were brought to you by the luminous Aaron Lacey and Clay Smith. So without further ado, I bring you the first article, which was titled The Association Between the Use of Balanced Fluids and Outcomes in Critically Ill Children, a Before and After Study out of the Journal of Critical Care. Normal serum chloride levels are about 106 milliequivalents per liter. Normal ranges vary. Not so normal, normal saline has 154 milliequivalents per liter. So you can see why after giving a few liters of this fluid to a patient, you might start to drive the chloride up. Remember that the average circulating volume of a healthy person is five to six liters. That said, normal saline has classically been the favored fluid until fairly recently. So what's happening is people start to switch over to balanced fluids. To find out, we zoom in on a single center PICU that switched from using normal saline to balanced fluids. And they analyzed about 1,400 patients before and then 1,400 after the switch, looking at the rates of acute kidney injuries. And there was no difference in the cohorts after switching away from normal saline to having plasmolite as the favored bolus fluid and lactated ringers as the dominant maintenance fluid. The primary outcome was AKI on day three of their stay in the PICU. And as I said, there was no difference. Even if there were lower rates of hyperchloremia and hyperkalemia with the balanced fluids. On the downside, there was more hypokalemia after the switch. So these are monitor-oriented outcomes though. What we care more about is the lack of difference in the need for renal replacement therapy, the lack of difference in the length of stay or ventilator-free days, and hospital mortality, all of which were secondary outcomes. Oddly, as a limitation after the switch, there was actually a significantly higher chance for these patients to be 10% fluid overloaded by day three. So when they changed fluids, somehow they ended up giving more fluids, and this could have weakened the benefit that you might have seen with balanced fluids. In a spoonful, after a PICU switched from normal saline to balanced fluids, there was no difference in the rates of AKI at day three of their patient stays. And then we have the second article, which was titled Fluid Balance and Outcomes in Critically Ill Patients with Traumatic Brain Injuries, Center TBI, and Oz Ender TBI, a prospective multicenter comparative effectiveness study out of the Lancet Neurology. Hypotension is, of course, no good for brain injuries. It's no need to wonder why Cushing's triad includes hypertension. We need to perfuse the brain. The first step in supporting blood pressure is often to give a fluid bolus, but too much fluids might not be much better than too little fluids. To get a better idea of how this works, let's take a look at some TBI patients in the ICU. This was a combination of two prospective trials. In Europe, the Center TBI study, and out of Australia, the Oz Enter TBI study. These studies included about 2,100 patients, and what they found was that a positive fluid balance was associated with an increase in mortality and there was an odds ratio of 1.1 per 100 milliliters of excess fluid. And the Glasgow outcome scores were also worse if there was a positive fluid balance. So of course, I'm sure everyone already conceptually aims for normal volemia. But this highlights how important it is and the dangers of not being vigilant about overshooting. A negative fluid balance was also bad, but it was not as bad as drowning the brain. We can't be certain this study wasn't confounded by that sicker patients were getting more fluids though. This prospective study design is never going to give us causality, but just give us an association. In a spoonful, aim for normal volemia in TBI patients. And if you're going to err on one side rather than the other, then try going for not giving that extra fluid bolus. This study showed an association between higher mortality and a positive fluid balance. 
And then the third article, which is titled Serum, Sodium Concentration, and Mental Status in Children with Diabetic Ketoacidosis out of the Journal of Pediatrics. Hyponatremia is common in DKA, and this is mostly caused by the osmotic force of hyperglycemia driving fluids intravascularly. Some will present with high or even normal sodium levels, though, and that's probably because of the excessive free water loss. Now, there's an association between low sodium levels and cerebral edema, as well as brain damage in these patients. So that sounds like something worth studying. This article is a secondary analysis of the PCARN fluid RCT, which was comparing the rate and composition of IV fluids given to pediatric patients with DKA. They found three factors that were associated with drops in glucose-corrected sodium levels, a higher starting sodium, pre-existing diabetes, and the use of half-normal saline. In terms of the rate of fluids, this had very little effect. As secondary outcomes, also likely more important outcomes, there was no association between altered mental status and cerebral edema compared to those who had their sodiums drop and those in whom it did not. I think this study helps justify the use of hypotonic saline in patients if that's already what you're using. It appeared to be safe. Though, you must keep in mind that this was a secondary analysis and this data was not collected to answer these questions. In a spoonful, in DKA patients who had a drop in their serum sodium as a result of the fluids that we gave them, there was no association between this and altered mental status or cerebral edema. The factors associated with decreases in sodium or pre-existing diabetes, a higher starting sodium when they arrived, and the use of half-normal saline. And following that, we have the fourth article, which was titled The Effect of Slower versus Faster Intravenous Fluid Bolus Rates on Mortality in Critically Ill Patients, the Basics Randomized Clinical Trial out of the JAMA. Now, your poor patient is having trouble perfusing their organs. So to help with that, you're going to try to give fluids to get their circulation back on track. This is clearly beneficial in many circumstances, but exactly how fast you give those fluids isn't really very well defined. Personally, I'd feel better about having more data on this topic rather than just hanging a bag and trusting to gravity and the height of my IV pole to get the rate right. This is the first part looking into the BASICS trial, BASICS standing for Balanced Solution in Intensive Care Study. This was a double-blinded randomized clinical trial done in 75 ICUs in Brazil, including over 10,000 adult patients. What they did in this study was compare two fluid infusion rates about a third of a liter per hour or a liter per hour. They also compared fluid types, normal saline versus plasmolite, but we'll get to that in the next article. The primary outcome was 90-day mortality, a pretty good strong outcome, and it was identical between the two groups, 26.6% in the slow infusion group and 27% in the fast group. On top of that, there was also no statistically significant difference in the rates of the secondary outcome, which was the need for renal replacement therapy. Now, the biggest arguments I usually hear about for fluids are which fluid is the best fluid to give, and then often how much fluids we should be giving. There are so many other variables that we really don't consider that much, though, like how quickly you actually want to give those fluids, what temperature those fluids are, and then when you'll give them as well. This study was a nice break from the usual arguments we have about fluids, and it was still an important question. It's also nice because it pretty well justifies your practice no matter how quickly you're giving fluids. Either you're giving them very fast or you're giving them pretty fast. Keep in mind though that this was an ICU-based study. In a spoonful, no matter if you like to give your fluids pretty fast or really fast, there is no difference in 90-day mortality found in this ICU study. And then finally we have the last article of the day which was titled The Effect of Intravenous Fluid Treatment with a Balanced Solution versus 0.9% Saline Solution on Mortality in Critically Ill Patients, the Basics Randomized Clinical Trial out of the JAMA. Over the last few years, the general feeling of normal saline versus balanced solutions has seemingly been slowly tipping towards the use of balanced crystalloids, certainly after the SMART and SALT-ED trials, which both showed better outcomes with balanced fluids. Though I can't say I agree with which trials people generally decide to replicate, looking at you vitamin C trials. Anyways, replication and repetition are still at the core of the scientific method. Perhaps if we bring it back to the basics, get it? Yeah, yeah. Then we'll find a little bit more nuance here than we've had in the past. So the last article looked at one arm of the basics trial, and now we're going to look at another article from the same study, this time looking at the hotly debated choice between saline and balanced crystalloids. 
So this is the same Brazilian ICU population as the last study. And again, we're looking at 90 day mortality in these patients. And but this time we're looking at them randomized between either receiving plasma light or normal saline. What they found was no significant difference in the 90 day mortality between the two fluid groups, both around 27%. There is also no difference in the need for renal replacement therapy or doubling of the creatinine. Now, these aren't quite the same outcomes that were measured in the SALT-ED or SMART trials that looked at major adverse kidney events and 30-day mortality, not 90-day. But the SALT-ED trial and SMART trials both showed decreases in these outcomes with balanced crystalloids. Were we wrong? Well, we can't overturn the previous data as easily as that. This was a much smaller study than the SMART study. And the non-significant difference did kind of lean towards balanced fluids. So perhaps if we had a higher powered study, like we saw in the SMART study, then a similar difference might have been uncovered in this basics trial as well. Also, and perhaps more importantly, the fluids recorded were only those given in the ICU. The fluids received before getting to the ICU were not controlled for, and we've seen that this is actually quite important in past studies. All in all, uh, taking into account that there are some secondary findings in studies like this, which we acknowledge are just hypothesis generating, maybe one fluid isn't going to be wholesale better than the other. Normal saline seems to perform better in patients with TBIs, but lactated ringers does better in DKA and sepsis. In a spoonful, I'd love to see big, good studies like this. A large RCT from Brazilian ICUs showed no difference in 90-day mortality between patients randomized to normal saline or balanced crystalloids. Okay, since we were just covering these big studies, which could inform your practice, you know what's totally crazy to me? If you're a doctor from Brazil that wanted to work in a center in North America, then you'd pretty well have to move here and retrain as a doctor because your qualifications from Brazil aren't really trusted. But the medical community at large is more than willing to accept the fine studies that are done by these same clinician scientists and use that to inform their care. If you really didn't think that their doctoring skills were up to par, then you shouldn't trust their data either. I mean, logically, isn't that crazy? How ridiculous are we being? It's a bit of weird hypocrisy there. Okay, rant done. Let's review this week's take. I'm just saying that these Brazilian doctors are probably doing a good job. Anyways, from the first article, a pick you before and after study. Switching from normal saline to balanced fluids revealed no difference in the rates of AKIs at day three of the pick you stay. Then the second article, easy on the fluids in TBI patients. Too much is worse than too little, and neither is as good as having just the right amount. From the third article, dropping serum sodium levels was not associated with altered mental status or cerebral edema in pediatric DKA patients. But those sodium levels were more likely to fall if the patient had pre-existing diabetes, higher serum sodium levels to start with, or if half normal saline was the solution that was used to resuscitate them. Fourth, some people like it fast. Some people like the fluid slow. You pick what's right for you. The basics trial showed no difference in 90 day mortality between the two. And then fifth, we were pretty confident after the SMART and SALT ED trials about using balanced fluids instead of normal saline. It's not as clear cut though from this trial which showed no difference. Perhaps we should be focusing on problem specific fluids instead of just one fluid to rule them all. And now then you've earned them and we offer them, we can provide you with some CME credits through a partnership with Hippo Education. All the details for that are at our website at journalfeed.org. It also helps support the blog and all the people that do this. We very much appreciate that. If you'd like to support me in particular, then go ahead and leave a rating on the iTunes store or the Apple podcast or wherever the heck you can. I know I would love that. That would be great. Anyways, links to all the articles that we summarize can be found at journalfeed.org as well. And if you haven't already, you can go ahead and subscribe to our newsletter and get daily spoon feeds through your email. Our goal here at the Journal Feed is to provide better patient care through spoon feeding. And so we're trying to help you keep up with the latest research, one spoonful at a time. Thank you. <laughs>